here in Glendale, California, in uh, Billy Bush's private studio, his private lair. Did you start with Garbage in the very beginning? No, um, of what, my career or their career? Of theirs. No, they... Or yours. They had, they, had, uh, they had made the first record, and then they had gone on tour, and done a couple of months of touring before I got involved. And then they called me to help sort of figure out how to um, pull off live what they'd done in the studio. Gotcha. Because um, they had made a record not thinking at all about playing a live show. So they called me in to kind of help, you know, figure out how to, you know, use technology, make the live show sound more like the record. When did you move out to LA? In 2005. Yeah, in 2005, we came off a tour and the band was going to go on hiatus. So my wife and I were sort of like, wow, we really don't have any place to live. We should move somewhere. <laughs> so we decided that, you know, LA made the most sense because right. we had a lot of friends, weather's always good and there's a lot of work out here for people to do. Where's your comfort zone or is there one? I like doing all of them for different reasons. I mean, they're all sort of um, use a different part of your brain, you know, and they're all a different sort of relationship with the musician that you're working with. And like working as a producer, there's a lot more of a psychological and um, emotional relationship that occurs with the, uh, with the artists. You have to really understand them and get to know what they're what their comfort zone is and how to get them out of their comfort zone and how to get push them to to do more than they think that they're capable you know as an engineer you're there to sort of serve i like engineering because it's sort of it allows me to just sort of kind of think about you know how can i make that sound different it's all about just sound making it sound cool you know making the producer i'm working with happy making the bands i'm working with happy and trying to come up with something that's unique and as a mixer for me, mixing is the most sort of creative thing for me. Um, you know, and usually I'm left to my own devices to kind of take something that somebody's recorded and try to figure out how to make that sound interesting to me. Try to come up with something that's like, you know, that nobody's heard before. Try to find something in the song that makes it really sort of immediate and grab people's attention, you know. So for me, it's like all three of them are, are cool in different ways. And what are you working on right now? Um, I just finished mixing the uh, new Jake Bug record, um, which uh, Rick Rubin produced, and it was cool. It was like I haven't done a record that's really sort of that um, stripped down, bare, you know, acoustic guitar and singer um, sort of record in a while, and it was a real interesting challenge to just like have it be really organic, like there. Where do you how do you approach a mix like that? Where do you start? Like, do you, is, is it you get the do you start with drums? Do you, where do you, how do you start to build that mix up from, from the foundation? It depends on the song. I mean, I kind of listen to the rough mix really quick and kind of get a vibe as to what the most sort of important thing is to me immediately. Most of the time it's the vocal, sometimes it's the beat, sometimes it's a riff of some kind. And whatever that is, I will try to, I'll try to create a sound for it that, that I think really makes it shine. And then I'll start working on the other elements to kind of fit around it in some way, shape, or form. You know, if it's a basic rock song, I'll start with a beat. Because first and foremost, it needs to kind of have a groove, a feel. Um, and then usually I'll go to the vocal after that. And then after that, start working on the other elements. When you're building the beat, where do you start gear-wise? Oh, um, you know, it's funny because like, I, every time I start something, it's like I kind of start from scratch in a way. It's like I don't, there's no like real sort of method or thing I like slap on or anything. It's like the, the sound of the kick drum is going to be different depending on who recorded it and how the guy plays, um, how, you know, what the vibe of the kick drum needs to be. You know, does it need to be hard and electric, electronic sounding? Does it need to be, you know, punchy? Does it need to be clicky? You know, it's like all those things sort of, I can't tell until I actually start listening to the mix and whole and kind of like, okay, how does it need to cut through everything? And that'll sort of dictate how I approach it. Do you, do you like to hit a lot of things subtly, or do you like to use a few things 
and really get the tone of that device. So that's not really anything that I use specifically because I know that it creates a, a certain tone. I mean, to me, it's like when I listen to something, I'll kind of immediately kind of get an idea as to what it is I feel it's missing. And then I'll use, start using a combination of things to try to figure out how to get that to where I want it to be. You know, if the vocal's really thin, then I'll start thinking about like, okay, you know, does it need to be EQ'd? Does it need to be compressed in some way? Does it need to be a combination of things? Um, I'll tend to use a lot of different things by the time I'm done. Like I'll very rarely will just like slap an 1176 on a vocal and call it a day. Although sometimes that's exactly what it needs, you know? But most of the times I'll be, I'll stack a bunch of different things because everything will do something a little bit differently. I see. You know, some of them will kind of make a nice and big and gluey sounding. Some will, you know, help take out the sibilance. You know, some will make it really add some aggression or, you know, you know, it's a combination of things. Like even when it comes to vocal reverbs, you know, I don't like a real reverb, right. you know, a big reverb on things, but sometimes like a nice plate is just what you need. But a lot of times I'll use, you know, six different reverbs on the vocal and they'll all just be slightly different. And all slightly... plug-in verbs? Um, no, there's a combination of hardware. What hardware verbs are you using? I use the Percossi. Okay. I use uh, a couple of reverbs in the Eventide H8000 that I really like. I like a lot of the UAD. Uh, that was the first thing that got me into the UAD plugins was the plate and right. the, uh, the, EMT, yeah. the EMT 250 right. and the Lexicon. Like, like to me, those things are so, are, are great. So a lot of times I'll use a combination of, you know, the Percosti on a room. I'll use um, this plate that I've programmed into the H8000. I'll have a sort of like a slap echo kind of thing going on in the H8000. And then I'll have a couple other sort of different size sort of reverbs. So that way I can control it also in the mix where it's like, you know, if it's really intimate, maybe it needs more space. You know, when the mix gets really big, maybe the space needs to go away some, so it cuts through more. So, you know, I tend to try to figure out a way to have it so that way I have a lot of options to try to make it be a little different, you know, all the right. way through the song. Do you run a, a mix through a verb? I never run a mix through a verb. I, I, I think that, that would be probably for the most part, unless you were trying to fix something that was really kind of messed up, it needed to have its natural sort of sound. Um, generally, I'd rather have like room mics that captured that, mm -hmm. if that was the case. But um, a lot of times I'll open up multiple versions. That's why I like a lot of the plugin versions of it. Like I wouldn't right. mind having, you know, multiple Bracostis because sometimes I'll fall in love with the room sound on the Bracosti that sounds great on drums. And then I'll be like, oh, okay, shit, I gotta print that so I could free it up and then I can use it on the background vocals. I right. print that so then I could free it up and use it on the lead vocal. What is it about the Bacosti that works so well for you? Because it comes up a lot you know, in conversations. Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny. It sounds, I think for a period of time, like everybody was starting to get into the plug-in reverbs. And they kind of, before UAD really modeled those really well. And I think that they ended up sort of there's something missing in those, mm -hmm. you know, like in the, con in, the, in the convolution sort of reverb world, it's perfect for a specific thing, like trying to put something in a specific sort of place. Like, you know, alto verbs, cello chambers, I love. It's amazing sort of, you know, that's a, that's a perfect example of what a convolution verb does great. Mm -hmm. But what it doesn't do well is add the detail and the always changing element, the modulation that happens with a hardware reverb. I gotcha. You know? That's what makes like, the old EMT 250s sort of not, cool. So it, not quite as dynamic in a sense. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it adds a certain extra level of realism, which is hard to get. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of hard to put your finger on, but it's one of those things when you listen to it, it's like, wow, you could have the Bricasi really subtle on something and it just makes it sound real. Or you can make it do some crazy stuff if you need it to. But you know, what it does remarkably well is models spaces in a way that makes them feel like the space does in real life as opposed to just sort of like a snapshot of it you know so in a way like to me a lot of the reverbs the digital reverbs feel kind of two-dimensional Bracasi sounds really three-dimensional i know you like to do analog summing yeah yeah so you're coming out of the box you're going back in uh -huh. what have the antelope clocks done for that aspect as far as retaining that the kind of information you're working on coming out and back in you know, it's funny because like I've always been really skeptical 
like you know like the world of converters and clocks and that sort of thing like i feel like it's really in the past it's been sort of a little snake oil you know and that you know we've done butch and i've done a number of shootouts between converters and clocks and things like and really listening intently and trying to figure out like okay does it make a difference does it change anything does it make a difference enough to make it worth a the hassle and b the the cost um and we never have right so you know it wasn't until i started hearing from other guys and i think it was probably um muse when butch and i worked with muse that was the first time i really ran into somebody that used the the 10m and enough to like fly it around with them sure and i was like okay well i you know i respect matt immensely i think he's got an amazing he's an amazingly talented dude and he's got an amazing um set of ears so i was like okay well if if he thinks that that's legitimate and it's actually making a difference maybe i should take it a little bit more seriously and check it out and you know when i came back after doing some uh, recording outside of the studio, came back here and was like, okay, what can I do to improve? You know, we're always looking for some way to kind of make it better, right? Sure. Yeah. You know, always trying to chase realism in a Hopefully. way. Hopefully. <laughs> and so I was like, well, what can I do to improve it? And I was like, well, I should try that clock. And I was at the time, I, was, I can't remember what, what I was working on, but I was working on something that was very organic. And it had also had a lot of reverb. And it was like, that was the one thing that I always felt was missing was... Um, like the real sort of depth, the soundstage depth. Like to me, a lot of like, you know, before Pro Tools HDX and before um, the new Pro Tools converters, the soundstage always kind of felt a little sort of short. Like there wasn't a lot of place to put things in the mix for these. Well, that's why I asked about that 3D comment. Yeah. Because that's, that, that seems to be what comes up most often. Yeah. And that's to me was like, as soon as I put that on, like I, I did an AB where I was like, okay, I'll print a mix. I got a mix. I like it. You know, using the internal clock on the 192s, print the mix. Cool. All right. Put the 10M on, clock it to the 10M, print the mix again, don't touch anything. Um, you know, label them exactly the same with one little thing that you wouldn't notice in the end of it when you listen to it, when you saw it on your iPhone. And then just put them on my iTunes library and then didn't think about it. And then went back to it a couple of days later, listened to it, AB'd back and forth. I was like, wow, one actually sounds really better. Hmm. Which one is it? And I had to come back, check my nose, and go, wow, okay, that's the that's the 10M. What's different about it? And then I started really kind of like soloing things up, listening to things, listening to things in the mix, trying to imagine what was different. And it really did have a thing of like that three dimension, like it kind of moved the soundstage a little deeper. Hmm. Like, oh, okay. So the things that are going on back here, which were really subtle, got lost in the previous thing without it. Right. And this sort of like cleared it up. So where it's like, oh, I can hear things. If I pan something and put it way back there, I can hear it. Hmm. Whereas in the past, like, it was like, oh, I must well just mute it. Can I hear it? Can I hear it? Nah, not really. Hmm. You know what I mean? So to me, that was, a, that was what really interested me about it. Then I took it in for a couple of sessions where I was tracking. And I found it remarkable how quickly it was able to get sounds in rooms I'd worked in before. Wow. You know, it's like, wow, okay, the drum kit sounds legit. The cymbals sound really good. I'm not having to fight the cymbals. Why am I not having to fight the cymbals? You know, nothing's different. Nothing's changed. I've used this drum kit in this room. The only thing that's changed is the clock. It's just easier. Mm. Why is it easier? You know, and I kept finding that thing happen. Come back here, start mixing. Oh, okay, that came together pretty quick. Translates great. Sounds great. You know, the details there, like if you listen on really high-end headphones, like really listening to the reverb trails on things. Right. You hear all the little things I'm talking about with the Picasso, sure. like the modulation and stuff that happens. Like, I uh, didn't really hear that before. What's changed? Just that, you know? Incredible. You know? So then, like after that, then upgrading into better converters, it's like, it gets to a point where, you know, I really feel happy now, like, you know, what it sounds like coming off of coming out of Pro Tools. Butch, what has Butch uh, weighed in on on the topic, but out of curiosity? You know, it, it, Butch is funny because like he doesn't really get that tied up in the gear anymore because I feel, I think that he has, he has enough guys that he works with that, you know, deal with that side of it. So he just sort of like trusts the, you know, me and, you know. Um, and we're talking about the great Butch Fig, obviously. Yeah. And, 
Um, what is it like working with him? What, where, when, you, when you say he relies on you, how did that dynamic take shape? Because I know you've worked with him for a while now. Yeah. And, uh, well, I, I think that, you know, I'm always, I'm always fascinated by new technology and, and how things change and how, you know, the theories about what makes music and recording music um, pleasant for people, you know, evolves over time. And, you know, I'm old enough to where I started out, you know, when I first started with, with Butch, we were still using tape all the time, you know, but Butch hired me because he wanted somebody that would be able to sort of bridge the gap between the analog world and all the stuff that was happening in the computer world. Because he was very interested in it, but he didn't want to get bogged down with like learning the ins and outs of how to keep a Pro Tools rig running at the time. I see. You know, the ins and outs of like, how, do you, how can you improve that side of it? Sure. more and more like he wanted to worry about improving the song improving the performances sure. worrying about like how to you know artistically make things better as opposed to necessarily technically make things better you know but he's always like you know what's great is like he's always open like if i go hey there's this new thing um it's really expensive we should check it out and he'll be like oh, how expensive <laughs> i go oh it's really expensive <laughs> well can we borrow it for a while and check it out yeah okay borrow it and then invariably it like ends up like, should we send it back? Nah, right. let's keep it, you know? So in that way, it's like, you know, he, he, he does like, um, he, he does like how things get things back to where there was, you know, before digital recording really started to take off, you know, you know, cause there was something about when you were recording the tape, we were recording all analog and recording the tape, we were always trying to make it sound the way it sounded in the room coming back off a of tape. Mm -hmm. And people forget about that. It's like, that was a constant struggle and never sounded the same. Right. Sometimes it improved, like with drums, it sounded it improved. But a lot of times like you lost things, right. which would bum you out. Like yeah, the tape thing is very glamorized, but you're right, a lot back it, in the day. Right? Back in the day, it's like we always hated it. We'd have it. never gone to digital if it was perfect, right? Yeah, and the <laughs> thing was like, you know, it was slow, it was expensive. Um, it was unreliable, you know, and, you know, there was inherent loss, like, you know, you know, you keep punching in on something and all the high end in that section goes away after a while, right. you know, the tape comes apart, you know, all these things that would happen with tape, but there was one magical thing about that process, which as, you know, computers and digital recording started to, to grow, it became more and more apparent what was missing. So what was missing? Just just that that detail or that repeatability or you know it there's there's something about the you know the realism of listening to some, to music in a room that we still are trying to capture and we still get really close but very rarely does it get to the point where it sounds like it does in the room and that comes down to all kinds of things like you know you're trying to record things with um, microphones instead of being able to hear them with your ear with your ears we don't really understand necessarily exactly how much we take in you know in the spatial awareness of, of being in a room right but with um you know in the analog world like i said we, we we tried to make it sound like it did coming out of the room and we never could so that's why digital first started seemed at, on the surface perfect because you were not losing you know, any fidelity on the tape. You were not losing the high end. It would come back consistently every single time, exactly the way you heard it the first time you hit play, which was great until you realized that there was something static about it, something that was sort of like flat and sort of lifeless. And what was that? It's like, you know, there were harmonics that were happening coming off tape, harmonics that were happening coming through transformers and tubes, and, you know, and, you know, these big behemoth desks. So we're now getting to the point where people are modeling that stuff pretty accurately. And anything we can do to sort of get out of the way of all the harmonics, get out of the way of, of you know, something coming from the digital world to the analog world, I think makes the listening process more enjoyable. You know? And people will debate whether or not it's worth it when everybody listens to it on earbuds. You know? and. And I think it, I think it is, because I think, you know, for us, you know, our goal is to make it sound as 
good as we possibly can. So what projects have you worked on uh, recently beyond the, beyond, besides the one you're doing now with Pledge? Um, well, let's see, kind of moving backwards, I just got done mixing um, part of the new Jake Bug record, um, which Rick Rubin produced. Um, he's an amazing, uh, I think, 19-year-old artist from the UK who's sort of like a... a Jake not, Bug? Yeah, Jake Bug. He's it's sort of a... If you could imagine a cross between Dylan and Oasis. Gotcha. It's him. And it's, it's, he's phenomenal. We like to flash iTunes albums up at the yeah. end of our videos, so we want to give some people a, yeah, so, a chance to look up some of your work. Yeah, so so the Jake Bug record is one that, that I'm really excited about. Um, right before that, I was I engineered the new Naked and Famous record, okay. um, which just came out last month. Um, and earlier this year, I produced a record by a band called The Boxer Rebellion. I remember we were talking about Yeah, that. and that was one of the ones which, like... Are they from Ireland, or...? They're from the UK. UK. Yeah, they're from the UK. Um, what else have worked on that way? It's a blur these days. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, I've, you know, um, I mixed the, uh, the whole garbage record here at the studio. The last garbage record. Um, okay, I don't know. Let's see. You gotta look at my website. <laughs> <laughs> we'll post a few of those. Yeah, yeah. And and look up Billy's work. He does excellent work. He's a, he's a very respected and, and talented engineer and producer. And we're proud to have you using Antelope. And we're proud that you took some time to hang out with us. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming by, guys. Thanks, guys.